Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael Kubista and it is my pleasure to present to you the latest advances in quality assessment in the molecular diagnostic workflow. This is a very hot topic today as molecular methods are advancing into routine, the requirements on reproducibility and standardization are rigorous. In my talk, I will also exemplify the approach by assessing the performance of a new high-throughput qPCR platform with integrated liquid handling, the IntelliQ. Tata Biocenter researchers have been working in the PCR field since 1991, starting out developing dyes and probes that became fluorescent upon binding DNA. In 1998, we founded the first company in Europe specialized in real-time PCR-based molecular diagnostics, and in 2001, the Tata Biocenters were founded. Our headquarter is in Gothenburg, Sweden. We are also present in Prague, Saarbrücken, and San Francisco. Working tight with leading instrument and solution providers, we have the best equipped laboratories for molecular analysis, where we offer hands-on training. We are also one of Europe's leading providers of molecular services, and we are behind many of the quality control methods and tools currently on the market. Implications of poor quality control can be detrimental, as illustrated by a recent case in Germany. For over two years, German investigators were searching for a serial killer who, based on DNA evidence, was linked to six homicides. DNA tests revealed the killer was female. Running through crime databases, the elusive killer was found active all around Germany and was also linked to 40 crimes including common theft, car dealership robbery and a school break-in. The suspect was eventually identified. It was a female technician from the production of the swabs. The cotton swabs used were not certified for DNA analysis. In 2002, a scientific report linked measles vaccine to autism. The supporting data were based on quantitative real-time PCR. The actual data are shown in the graph. To the left are positive standard samples, and to the right we see the patient samples that were interpreted as positive by the investigator. The interpretation of the qPCR data was called into question by Dr. Stephen Buston, who appeared as expert witness for the defense in the U.S. of federal claims in Washington, D.C., when the vaccine producer was sued. The publication was eventually retracted and the news was spread. But it was too late. People had lost confidence in the vaccine, leading to measles outbreaks across the world, sometimes even with deadly outcome. How could such questionable qPCR data end up in a prestigious journal, causing so much harm? This question was asked by Stephen Buston, who gathered a group of experts in the qPCR field, and together we wrote the Mikey Guideline. The Mikey guidelines request papers presenting qPCR results to provide validation data and sufficient information about the experiment for the reviewers to be able to assess the quality. Compliance with the Mikey guidelines is today requested by over 25 journals and recommended by many more. In diagnostics, quality measurements are even higher since treatment decisions are based on the test results. In the diagnostic workflow, most of the issues leading to uncertainty, variability and bias are introduced during the pre workflow rather than by the actual molecular analysis. 
This led the European Commission to launch the project Spedia under the coordination of Kajin to standardize and improve the preambic workflow. Objectives included identifying factors that impact on the test results and develop technologies and tools to control the workflow and assess the quality of the material being tested. Speedy activities included proficiency ring trials. Samples were shared among participating laboratories across Europe that were instructed to prepare DNA or RNA using their standard operating procedures and return the purified nucleic acid to us for quality measurements. Out of more than 100 participating routine laboratories, 33% had at least two quality indicators out of range when analyzing RNA. Based on the problems identified and addressed in Spedia, the European Committee for Standardization, CEN, initiated in 2010 a program to develop technical specifications for the pre-analytical processing of samples that are about to be published. In 2014, the International Organization for Standardization, ISO, launched eight projects to address the pre analytical phase in molecular diagnostics. The forthcoming guidelines are related to the analysis of RNA in SNAP frozen tissue, the analysis of proteins in SNAP frozen tissue, the analysis of DNA in FFP tissue, the analysis of DNA, sorry, the analysis of RNA in FFP tissue, the analysis of protein in FFP tissue, the analysis of RNA in blood samples, the analysis of genomic DNA in blood samples, the analysis of cell-free DNA in blood. 37 countries participate in the ISO effort, and an additional 20 countries are observing. This map indicates if the guidelines will apply to your country. So what have we learned from Spedia, my key, and from internal QC work? I will take you through how we assess the performance of new systems at Tata, and I will provide an example. We always start by performing a static curve to assess the precision and the dynamic range. We also assess the limit of quantification, which is the lowest concentration of an analyte that can be quantified. And we assess the limit of detection, which is the lowest amount of sample that can be detected. The standard curve is constructed by analyzing samples of known concentrations that cover the range of interest. The precision of the standard curve is assessed by calculating the working hotline confidence band that indicates where the standard curve is expected to be with 95% confidence. And a linearity test is performed to determine the dynamic range. The PCR efficiency is estimated from the slope of the standard curve and the precision of the estimate is calculated. Here, the PCR efficiency is within 92.8 and 99%, with 96% being the best estimate. The limit of quantification is assessed by inspecting the spread of replicates. As you can see in this serial dilution, the spread increases with decreasing concentration, that is, with increasing CQ value. This is due to a phenomenon known as sampling ambiguity. Consider a patient infected by influenza virus having a load of one viral molecule per milliliter of blood. If we collect one mil of blood from that patient, this particular mil may contain one viral molecule, but it may also accidentally contain two, three, or perhaps even four. And there is also a distinct possibility the particular mill of blood collected contains no virus at all, and we obtain a negative test result. 
The probabilities for those outcomes are given by the Poisson distribution, which is, which is depicted in this graph. The purple line indicates the probabilities for the example I just gave. The probability is sampling of one mill contains exactly one molecule when collected from a container with an average concentration of one molecule per mill is 37%. The probability it contains two molecules is 18% and it is 7% probability it contains three. The probability it contains none is also 37%. This variation across replicates due to sampling ambiguity gives rise to the imprecision in the quantification of low concentrated samples. There is no generally agreed acceptable spread of replicates. It varies from case to case depending on the precision requested for the particular test to make conclusions. At Tata, unless we have other specifications, we request the relative standard deviation, also known as the coefficient of variation, of the estimated concentrations to be less than 35%. The limit of quantification shall also be within the dynamic range of the test, and it cannot be below the limit of detection. From the Poisson distribution, we can also calculate the theoretical limit of detection. This graph indicates the probability of sampling is positive as a function of the target concentration in the container. From the graph follows, an average of three target molecules per volume analyzed is required to produce 95% positive reads. Hence, working at 95% confidence, the theoretical limit of detection due to sampling ambiguity is three molecules. This limit is independent of the measurement technology. In practice, the limit of detection, limit of quantification, dynamic range and efficiency of a system can be substantially below the theoretical limits due to confounding factors and the performance parameters must be determined for each case. Tata Biocenter was recently requested by Douglas Scientific to assess the performance of their new integrated liquid handling and real-time PCR platform called the IntelliCube. For the validation, we use the test assay Valid Prime. Valid Prime is one of the most popular assays for calibration. Its prime use is to control for genomic background in gene expression studies. When measuring gene expression by RT-QPCR, the transcripts are converted to cDNA, which is amplified. The primers targeting the cDNA may also be complementary to the genomic copy of the gene and amplify also any residual genomic DNA that is present. To reduce the risk, primers for RT-PCR are, when possible, designed to span an intron. Since introns are not present in transcripts, such primers will be close on the transcript, efficiently producing short amplicons, while on the genome, the primers are separated by the intron, which effectively reduces amplification efficiency, often close to zero. This strategy works well for native genes that have introns. Some genes, however, have no introns. Further, in eukaryotes, some 15% of the genes have pseudogenes. Pseudogenes are non-functional copies of the native gene, and about half of the pseudogenes lack introns, as they are copies of transcripts once formed by retro transposition. There may be hundreds of pseudogenes for any given gene, that are amplified, giving rise to serious background in RTQPCR, even when using intron spanning primers. My key guidelines request the investigator to control for genomic DNA background in gene expression analysis. Standard procedure has been to perform a parallel control experiment, leaving out the reverse transcriptase in the RT step. 
All samples are then analyzed for all the says also in this RT negative control. This measures the genomic DNA background, which can then be subtracted. Measuring RT negative controls works well, but is costly because everything has to be done twice. If we analyze the expression of four genes in five samples, for example, we must run five RT negative controls followed by five times four, that is 20, PCR controls. Some years ago, with Henrik Laurel, we developed the valid prime to control for genomic DNA background. Valid prime is an assay specifically targeting a conserved known transcribed genomic sequence present in exactly one copy per haploid genome. Valid prime does not amplify any cedium. It measures only the genomic DNA present. To correct RTQ-PCR data for genomic DNA background, we must also consider the sensitivity for genomic DNA of the assays we use. This is done by calibrating them with a genomic DNA standard. Knowing the amount of genomic DNA in the different samples and the sensitivity of the assays we use for genomic DNA, we can correct the measured CQ values for the genomic DNA contribution. The approach is even more sensitive than measuring RT negative controls and it saves on cost. For this example, 4 plus 5 plus 1 PCR controls are sufficient. The genomic DNA standard supplied with the valid prime kit is calibrated against the Human Genomic DNA Standard reference material from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which makes it possible to calculate the number of genome equivalents of a sample contains and makes absolute measurements possible. We will take advantage of this calibration when we assess the performance of the IntelliQ. <clears throat> I will now do the analysis of the data collected on the IntelliQ using the GenX software. The GenX software is compatible with essentially all the instruments on the market and we will start by using the import wizard to get the data. In the curtain menu, we select the Douglas Scientific IntelliQ. We then select the year. data files on the IntelliQ. We open them and we import them. This is a pretty large data set because the IntelliQ is a high throughput instrument. The data imported are arranged with samples as rows and genes as columns. There is only one column here containing CQ values because it's only a single static curve. The concentrations of the standards are given in column D and the replicates are given in column E. The data are now loaded for analysis. We receive a warning that the data set contains missing data. This was indeed expected since we performed a very extensive static curve to determine also the limit of detection where we do expect missing data because we should have negative samples. Fortunately, GenX handles the missing data automatically. The first thing we do is just to make a quick static curve of all the data present. We obtain a warning that the data contains outliers based on the outlier test performed by GenX. 
Here is a static curve. There are, few, <coughs> and we, there are two things we note immediately. First, the spread of the replicates increases towards lower concentrations. As already mentioned, this is due to the sampling ambiguity. And indeed, at low concentrations, we do see an outlier. The spread of replicates and the increase towards low concentrations is even more evident in this plot to the left, which is the residual plot. Note the very large number of replicates we have performed at low concentrations, even up to 64 replicates. And a large number of replicates is indeed needed if you want to determine a limit of detection and limit of quantification with high precision. Let's stop here with the static curve. We'll return to it later and continue determining the limit of quantification. This is the analysis here. Uh, we will use a threshold of 35% relative standard deviation, and we press run to analyze the data. The plot shows the relative standard deviation, which is equivalent to the coefficient of variation, as a function of the concentration of the standards in log scale. The red line indicates the threshold that we have set, which is 35% relative standard deviation. And the uh, vertical line identifies the sample that has lowest concentration and is still below the threshold of 35% relative standard deviation. This concentration is 32 molecules. So the limit of quantification of the valid prime assay analyzing genomic DNA on the IntelliQ is 32 molecules. Next, let's also determine the limit of detection. That's here. Since we're using probes, we will increase the cutoff and we press run. This plot shows the fraction of positive replicates as a function of concentration in log scale. The data are fitted to the LOD function, and at 95%, the LOD is read out, and it is determined to 2.95 molecules, which is essentially the theoretical limit of detection of three molecules limited by the sampling ambiguity that we just concluded. Having determined the limit of detection to three molecules and the limit of quantification to 32 molecules, let's now return to the standard curve, because the standard curve should only be applied to the linear range where we have reliable data. Hence, we should not use concentrations below 32 molecules, because those are below the limit of quantification. We open the data manager to create such a subset of the data. In the data manager, we have all the samples listed, and we can create groups. We go to groups, and let's create a group that of low concentrated samples. And then we will use logical operator to assign samples to that group that have a concentration that is less than 32 molecules. So these samples are automatically now assigned to this group by GenX. We go back to the data selection. We select the group. And we deactivate the selection. We save the data. 
and we close the data manager. Now we repeat the standard curve. This time the analysis is only for samples with 32 or more molecules. As you can see in the standard curve, now the spread of replicates is roughly the same at all concentrations as expected because this spread is now only due to the instrument rather than to sampling ambiguity. And we can now also inspect the report which is quite comprehensive with all the statistics, outlier tests, linearity check. And if we go to the bottom, we find the most important uh, performance indicators, which is the PCR efficiency. The PCR efficiency for these data is 99.7% with a confidence range of 97.7 to 101.7%. I will now return to my slides. A complementary technique to qPCR is digital PCR. Digital PCR is particularly suitable for very precise quantification of nucleic acids. It is based on analyzing a single sample using a large number of partitions. When the sample is loaded, the target molecules distribute across the partitions such that most partitions contain either none or only a single target. PCR then produces products only in those partitions that contain target molecules. Counting the number of positive reactions, taking into account the Poisson distribution, we estimate the total number of target molecules that were loaded. The Mikey guidelines for digital PCR were recently published with Jim Huggett from LGC as lead author. Using the valid prime and the calibrated genomic DNA, we tested the sensitivity of the IntelliQ reactions using the digital PCR approach. Distributing a sample across multiple wells we can, from the number of positive reactions and the known reaction volumes, estimate the number of target molecules loaded. Loading an average of two molecules per well, the number of positive reactions corresponded to 1.96 molecules, with a confidence range of 1.8 to 2.15 molecules per well. Hence, a perfect agreement. Loading a single molecule per well, the number of positive reactions was somewhat less than expected. In summary, using the valid prime and calibrated human genomic DNA, we have found Best estimate of the PCR efficiency on the IntelliCube is 99.7% with a confidence interval of 97.7 to 101.7%. The limit of detection is three molecules, which is the theoretical limit due to sampling ambiguity. The limit of quantification at 35% relative standard deviation is 32 molecules. The sensitivity per well is 1 to 2 molecules, with 100% recovery at an average load of 2 molecules per well. I have taken you through the standard procedure to assess the new system. In this case, the IntelliCube from Douglas Scientific. 
The same approach can be used to assess any new instrument, test, kit, or to validate a new batch of reagents. If you are interested in learning more about the methods to design, optimize, and validate molecular analysis, you are welcome to join any of the Tata Biocenter hands-on courses offered across the world. I thank you for your attention.